If you've never listened to any of these interviews, or usually cut out early, please listen to this one all the way through. There's a message at the end that's really important for you to hear. If you've never heard of David Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, retired, but you're in the military or any sort of law enforcement, you're not doing yourself any favors. He's the one who gets a lot of credit for developing the idea of law enforcement and military folks and other emergency services as sheepdogs. He's also the author of several notable books, among them On Killing, On Combat, and Assassination Generation. If the reading list seems a little morbid, it's because after serving as a sergeant in the 82nd Airborne Division and a number of other responsibilities, he became a professor of psychology at West Point. His books and many of his lectures and training focus on the body's response to extreme conflict and danger, including killing during combat. In one of my standard lectures I give to a new group of airmen here at Fort Leonard Wood, I talk about the importance of maintaining sheepdog training and mentality during your military life. At the end of this, I'll read a little inner excerpt in case you're not familiar with it. I'll also put links to his website and a list of books if you'd like to learn more, and I encourage you to do so. I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Colonel Grossman. We talked about the sheepdog mentality, gun control, the future of American military, and a bunch more. I hope you get as much out of this as I did. <laughs> Hey, Sean. Hey, how you doing, sir? Doing good, doing good. Hey, thanks uh, for calling here. I'm sorry, I was out of whack. I hit it in my mind 11. Everything said 10. I just had a had a brain fart here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really tickled to talk to you about. Are you, are you up to speed on what I'm trying to do here? Yeah, well, uh, tell me about it. Okay. So I'm in. Uh, I'm a master sergeant in the Air Force, and I'm stationed down here at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. And we've got a small Air Force detachment where we train... Um, vehicle operators, engineer assistants, heavy equipment operators, and emergency managers. And a lot of the training is in tandem with the Army, and that's why we're here. And so, but we have a whole staff of NCOs, E5s and E6s, a couple of E7s. And so we're, we're working on some NCO professional development material. It's a, a series of seminars that we're putting together. And I put together a list of subjects, and on the list of subjects is the sheepdog mentality. Because I, I heard you give a lecture, I think it was like 2012, I, I, I saw you in uh, Fort Dix, and it just it really impressed me, so I kind of adapted it to our Air Force needs. So when I, when I talk to the new airmen that are coming through, and I talk to them about the importance of sheepdog training and maintaining their own training and stuff like that. So, um, but anyway, so I was working on these, but I'm taking all these subjects and issuing out as a podcast so everybody can listen to them, you know. And as I was working on this, I thought, well, why not just go to the source, right? So that's why I sent an email out and said, you know, because I would love to get your perspective on um, how this kind of stuff applies to Air Force, like especially those career fields that I talked about, you know. So that, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Great. And well, I let me talk to you about that. And I'm glad you called. Yeah. I'm honored this should work out. Hey, you know, your first question is, uh, you know, how does the sheepdog model really apply to airmen? And uh, I... Uh, uh, you know, my son is Air Force Combat Controller, just recently made Master Sergeant. Right, I knew about that. Yeah, he's uh, nine combat tours. Uh, he was there in the invasion of Afghanistan and ever since, and uh, three Bronze Stars, and uh, we're awful proud of him. But, uh, uh, you know, what, what I want you to understand is, you know, some of you guys will be going Red Horse. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and, of course, they're right there on the front lines. Uh, you know, we had, a, um, we had an airfield in, uh, in Afghanistan overrun. And we had the battalion, you know, a pilot, battalion commander, you know, the pilot 05 leading the ground assault against these guys. And the uh, Harriers taking off and firing from a hover, uh, helicopters taking off. You know, the, the idea that in this day and age, uh, there are no real lines. And, uh, yeah. we, you know, we, we saw it at the beginning of the war in the invasion of, of uh, uh, the invasion of, of, uh, of Iraq when, uh, you know, when, when a convoy gets misrouted and suddenly finds themselves in the middle of the war. And, and that was traditional warfare, given the, the way we are now. And uh, uh, there, there are no real lines. And, and everybody needs to have that sheepdog mindset. You know, you, mm. we don't want wolves. Uh, and we sure don't want sheep. 
You know, the, yeah. the training is to develop uh, predators, people who at the moment of truth are ready to do uh, what needs to be done to protect themselves and others and to accomplish the mission. So the, the idea that, you know, somehow uh, one service doesn't need it, obviously you and I both know is, is, is bogus, and we've got to constantly right. remind them of that. Yeah. Um, well, in my in my experience, because I'm an I'm a engineer technician, you know, so I like most of my career was sitting behind a desk and making maps and, you know, do a survey once in a while. And then in, in 2003, uh, I got deployed to Kirkuk. And when we first got there, you know, the Army was still having firefights, you know, around the base. And I found myself being, you know, I was a desk jockey, jo jockey and having to, you know, chamber around. And you know, I never shot a fire in anger, but came came real damn close a few times, you know. And um, the, the, your next two questions tie in with that, too, you know, about uh, right. level of discipline. And uh, you know what? Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting book you may find of value. It's called This Kind of War. It was about the Korean War. And the author's name, uh, the author's name will come to me in a minute. Uh, but it was about how at the end of World War II, uh, everybody said, look at the Air Force. Said, they don't do all this marching and they don't have all those uh, haircut policies. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we need to be like the Air Force. They actually had a, a Doodle commission with Jimmy Doodle, very, very respected pilot, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, 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 granite, and, and they, they kind of gutted discipline. And the thing that they became aware of when the Korean War began was, uh, you know, in a, in a aircraft, uh, one person makes a decision to go towards danger and the others don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. On the ground, every individual has to make that decision to go towards the fight. Mm -hmm. Now, they realized oh. that relaxed discipline and relaxed... Uh, you know, it, on, on a, it's one thing on a bomber crew, but for the people right. on the ground, for the individuals, uh, they realize that the discipline, the uniform standards, the haircut standards, the uh, the, the obedience, uh, you know, the, the, the formations were absolutely essential for survival on the, on the battlefield. Hmm. And um, T.R. Furenbach was the name of the, the author. The author said T.R. Furenbach, this kind of war. I think you'll find it fascinating. It's the best book written on the Korean War, but it's also the best book written on the issue of discipline in this battle. And what I tell people is we're taking people today with pop-up targets and realistic simulators, and we're making them the best trigger pullers we've ever seen. They're, they're, they're the best at killing. They're the best at pulling the trigger and engaging the enemy. And, and we send them to distant lands. We give them years of practice at killing people, and we bring them home. What's to stop them from using their skills at home? And, and every warrior society has had to face this dilemma. Uh, the truth is the returning veteran is less than a tenth as likely to commit a violent crime as a non-veteran. And the reason is discipline, discipline, discipline. Every warrior society had, had, uh, had, had distinctive haircuts. The, the, the Spartans went to dreadlocks. They used it for coaching for the helmets. The Romans were high and tight, probably best for hygiene. Uh, the Mongols had the top knot, uh, the, the forelock. The, the samurai had the top knot. The uh, the uh, the Brits were into the mustache. You know, the the the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Amish grow a beard, they cut off their mustache because the mustache was a symbol of a warrior. During the Civil War, we that. were all about the beard. You know, we we had uh, you know Grant and Lincoln and the beard, and then we went high and tight again, which is probably best for, uni for uniform standards. And then this mm -hmm. war began, and we took our Rangers who were just known for their, their haircut. Their haircut was their symbol. Mm -hmm. And uh, and all of a sudden the rangers were told, grow it out, Roger out. Now we're out, cut it off, Roger out, grow it out, Roger out, cut it off, Roger out. <laughs> we don't give a damn what our hair looks like, like some right. flaky freaking fashion model. Mm -hmm. What matters is submission to discipline. Right. And whatever the hell the standard is, we enforce it. Right. And that's, that's the NCO's job, that's sergeant's business is enforcing the standard. And that's why, you know, the old sergeant major or the old chief is making everybody establish their, their uniform standards. That's the safeguard. And, and so this discipline, regardless of who you are and what you do, there are no real lines and there. There is nobody who doesn't need military discipline. That's the safeguard. We don't, we don't turn people into warriors, killers, without that safeguard of discipline. So, so integrate that into the sheepdog model to understand that everybody, you know, that whether it's uniform standards, haircut standards, 
uh, formations, you know, a little drill and ceremony every now and then. Those are the things that make us different from the mob. Those are the things that make us different from uh, from from the average uh, criminal killer out there. That's the difference between the sheepdog and the wolf is discipline. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you also said, uh, uh, you know, the mentality of civilians uh, defending their loved ones. Uh, is there a difference? And the fact is that of all the kind of violence we could engage in, violence to protect your family, violence to protect your loved ones is the one we're wired to do. Mm-hmm. When somebody threatens our children, threatens uh, our family, everything changes. And uh, so so there is a difference between the average civilian out there uh, who is defending their loved ones. But the difference is that it needs to be a higher level of discipline and under authority. You're, you're not just the mom protecting her pups. You know, I, we've got a, a book, a, a Sheepdog Kids book, which has really been successful. And I'll be speaking right. in the next NRA convention, and we'll have our next book out. It's called Why Mommy Carries a Gun. And it's, it's a children's book. It's lots of fun. Right. But it talks about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we, we protecting our family is what we're wired to do. It, right. For those who have to travel to distant lands and inflict violence on others, the safeguard again comes back to discipline and training, and we can't ever back off on that. Uh, it's, so, um, it, it, it's really the dynamic, again, of, of discipline. There's a difference between the, the sheepdog and the wolf or the sheepdog and, and the sheep. Please, please go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask about um, the, one of the other questions I sent you before is that as I was researching some of your work, um, I came across a couple of websites that are just really, really critical of the sheepdog mentality because they say that it's not just uniformed services that, that adopt that, but, you know, anybody, we're Americans, we have the Second Amendment, so, you know, if you want to defend your family, then you should, and the sheepdog mentality should apply to everybody. But my, my contention is that, well, that may be the case, you know, I think there's a difference between you know, the sheepdog who wants to protect, you know, his or her immediate family and loved ones versus someone else who says, you know, I, I care about my community and I care about my society and I'm going to step up and put on a uniform so I can even protect people that I don't know. Is that, am I on track with that, do you think? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one, one guy, it's just a metaphor. You know, the model's just a, a metaphor to kind of wrap your mind around to reflect the reality. But one guy said that, and I think he really did well, he says, at home we have the sheepdog, but overseas we got the wolfhounds. You know, they're, they're actively hunting the wolf. Uh, and that's not a bad way to look at it. You know, there, there is a difference between the two. If you want to talk in terms of wolfhounds, that's not a bad way to look at it. Uh, we, we really do need to have that warrior mindset, that sheepdog mindset. Uh, you know, we, every, every single person in our armed forces has been through basic training has fired a rifle, knows what to do in the front lines. You know, the Marines say uh, every Marine is a rifleman first. Mm-hmm. And in the modern battlefield, at least you've got to acknowledge that every single person is a rifleman, maybe not first, but second. You know, whatever their primary job is, they've always got to be able to grab a rifle and roll out the door and, and defend themselves and, and accomplish the mission. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, I think maybe the second Sheepdog Kids book will placate some of the, some of those people who, you know, <laughs> the Sheepdog model wasn't intended to uh, to leave out the, the American citizen by any stretch. Right. And the other part of that, the people with uh, the anti-cop business, it's, uh, you know, the, the cop haters uh, mm-hmm. have just come out of the woodwork. Uh, the number of officers murdered in the line of duty last year exploded. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's the other side of the equation are the ones who... Uh, the whole uh, anti-cop rhetoric has imploded and right. and, uh, and fallen by the wayside, thank goodness. Uh, in the, the Gallup poll last fall, the public opinion of law enforcement was the highest it's been since 1968 when it was one point higher. Uh, right. 76% of all Americans strongly support law enforcement. But the cop haters have been empowered. And, and that right. whole dynamic is really continuous between the sheep and the sheepdog, that desire to uh, to pull the sheepdog's fangs, to, to turn them into sheep, uh, we've got to fight that constantly. You know, the Air Force has really been leading the way 
on uh, allowing our uh, security forces to carry off duty, allowing some concealed care permit holders to carry on duty. Mm -hmm. uh, after Fort Hood, after the Naval Yard, after several other massacres of our, our troops here in American soil left unarmed, uh, we're beginning to realize that, that that mindset needs to be applied across our armed forces at right. home as well. That, right. uh, that concealed carry, protecting those around me model, uh, as the war progresses, and so I, I fear very crazy bad times are coming, we've just begun our battle against these terrorists, domestic and, and external. Right. And that we're going to find ourselves needing to be in the, what I call the Israeli model. Israel, faced right. with this threat for over half a century, has found the only possible answer, and that's armed people everywhere. Uh, they call it the, the swarm tactic, like a swarm of angry bees. Everybody charges at the sound of the guns. Right. And that's that's where we're evolving to is that Israeli model, and the sooner the better in a lot of ways. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, no, it makes absolute sense. And in fact, I was thinking while you were talking, I, I live here in Missouri, and they recently did away with the, the concealed carry permit requirements. So, and I got to tell you that um, I, I tend, in my politics, I tend to lean a little bit to the left. Um, more like a classical liberal than like, you know, I'm not a psycho social justice warrior you're burning stuff down, obviously, you know, I'm a liberal, uh, you know, with, with the original yeah. meaning of the word. Yeah. And so, but I'm a, I'm a East coast guy. So we came from New Jersey and in Jersey, they've got very, very strict, uh, um, concealed carry laws. And there's a, there's a different feeling though. I got to admit, like, so when I go back to New Jersey and I go for a walk in the woods and I, and I see somebody. I mean, I'm, I'm 98 and a half percent sure that that person does not have a firearm. And there's kind of a, there's a different feeling between the two of you versus when I walk in the woods in Missouri and I'm 98% sure that guy does have a gun. And, um, but I can see, you know, so half my brain kind of thinks like a liberal. I can see where the liberal would rather meet somebody in the woods and know that they don't have a gun, except for that one time when you're wrong, because you're only at 98%. Exactly. You know? And that means that two out of a hundred are going to have a weapon, and one of them is probably not a good person, you know. So, so one of the most powerful psychological effects is called self-perception theory, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, it boils down to whatever it is that I'm doing, my neighbors are doing, it must be right. Uh, mm. And uh, they concealed carry, uh, 43 states are now shall issue concealed carry. And only seven states left, of which New Jersey is one, right, that, that doesn't have what we call shall issue concealed carry. And, and we've kind of done this experiment 43 times in which, like Missouri, they go concealed carry. And, and it's never gone in and come back out again. And that's interesting. You know, America's 50 laboratories for democracy. Somebody tries something that's stupid, nobody else tries that, and they, they get back on track. Mm -hmm. but, 43 states have gone shell issue concealed carry, and, and the people look around and say, you know, that's, not, that's the way it ought to be. I, I'm doing it. My neighbors are doing it. It must be right. Can, can you um, elaborate? What, you, you said shell issue. What is that? Self-perception, the way you perceive yourself. Self no, no, no. You said, you said that uh, a, sh a shell issue concealed Oh, shell carry. issue concealed carry. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of general political term for what Missouri has and, uh, and 43 states have is shall issue concealed carry, which means the state must issue a concealed carry permit uh, unless they can show good reason otherwise. They, the, other, the other seven states are may issue. That means the state may issue a concealed carry permit depending on whether or not they think you, you need one. So there's, there's all the difference in the world between shall issue, which means the state has got to issue a concealed care permit unless you got a felony record, mm -hmm. and, and may issue, which is the New Jersey model where, yeah, we can give it to you if we choose to, but we choose not to in most cases. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, uh, you know, everywhere on the planet, if you're wealthy uh, or a politician, you have armed people well, all around you. Right. Uh, the average citizen doesn't have that ability in, in, in around the planet. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the point of all that is, as we see our military coming back from 15 years of war, where everybody was carrying, and as we see uh, more and more of these in, internal terrorist attacks, 
you're going to see this evolution. Kind of what you're talking about living in Missouri is kind of the evolution from, you know, the liberal to the libertarian, mm-hmm. which uh, we, which says, you know, well, all these other guys are carrying and things go on and, you know, and crime is down, you know, well, this must not be a bad idea. We're going to see something like that happen to our armed forces over time. Mm-hmm. And it's not a bad thing. Um, we we constantly evolve. We look around and see what happens. We see other people trying it and say, well, what do you know that worked? Mm-hmm. Uh, we really, in the military, have this, this, this uh, concept uh, in pronus that people shouldn't be carrying guns around. Mm-hmm. And changing that perception on our bases has been essential, and it's happening. And and it's really, you know, to old Army Ranger like me, to a lot of the Marines out there, it's really amazing how the Air Force, on the Air Force bases, have led the way on some of these uh, these issues of allowing the security forces to carry off duty like other cops, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. allowing certain selected concealed care permits to apply. Uh, you know, we're standing up predator and reaper squadrons across America, and I've had the honor to, to talk to most of them. And uh, those guys are, are number one targets for the bad guy, and we've already made allowances for them to be able to protect themselves and their loved ones, both you know, while they're traveling onto the base and off of the base. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of that. And, and what you're talking about is that, that normal, healthy evolution from, uh, from, uh, from you know, anti-gun to say, well, it's not that big a deal, and there may be a time when we need it. That's you know kind of what, as I understand what's happening to you, is a good insight into self-perception theory. And mm-hmm. 43 states have gone through this process of kicking and screaming and fighting against concealed carry every step of the way. It goes in, and they say there'll be bloodshed, there'll be chaos, you'll be sorry, this law's coming back out, you watch, and never once did that happen. And so there's that, that powerful manifestation uh, as a nation as we 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 declare ourselves as sheepdogs, protect ourselves and our loved ones, and of our military as a kind of a delayed reflection of our society making similar decisions. Does that make sense? Mm, Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, I wanted to get back to the training environment. Uh, You talked about, so you've got, you've got your book, uh, Assassination Nation. Yeah, Assassination Generation. Assassination Generation, sorry. Yeah. And um, I, I didn't know about that until I started researching for this interview. Yeah. And yesterday I was looking through some of the statistics and along with a lot of your other presentations, uh, there's some pretty, pretty sobering stuff out there. Yeah. But regarding the, the training environment. So we talked about the importance of, you know, sheepdog training and sheepdog mentality with trainees, but all of the new trainees that are coming in are coming out of this assassination generation. Yeah. You know, and we have, you go into the day rooms and they've got big screen TVs up and there's the, the single person shooter games and killing things and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that right now is a time that we should be spending more time and focusing more on that sort of rudimentary, rudimentary discipline, Yeah, you know, to, to, because that we may be bringing in some dangerous people. Yeah. Well, here's then, what I've but, seen. Yeah. Here's, then, here's what I've seen in 15 years of war. Been there from the very beginning, worked with everybody worked with many of the foreign nations. Um, There's almost uh, two parts of our civilization out there. Uh, One are the ones who internalized at at a young age uh, Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. The other is a generation that internalized, uh, as children, internalized uh, Sopranos, Breaking Bad and Sons of Anarchy, and the Anglo at the end of Grand Theft Auto. Those who have internalized violence in a criminal model are, are very frightening. The homicide rate in the last couple of years has exploded like nothing we've, we've really ever seen before. Uh, medical technology is holding down the murder rate. Major right. UMass Harvard study, if we had 1970s technology, the murder rate would be four times what it is. And, mm-hmm. and that data is almost 20 years old. You know, we all understand that wound that nine out of ten times would have killed you in World War II, nine out of ten times of the modern metal for you survived that wound. Well, the same thing is true in our streets. And so the number of dead people completely underrepresents the problem. The number of people murdered in America has been coming down 
every year for 25 years, almost without fail. Not just the homicide rate, but the wrong number of people killed, just like the, the number of people killed in traffic accidents been coming down every year because of airbags and seatbelts and medical technology. Right. But in 2015, the homicide rate exploded. It was up uh, 17% across the board in 50 largest cities. And then 2016, it's up 21% in our top 50 largest cities and in city after city and the first three months of uh of this year we, we see more homicides than the previous year this is the assassination generation these are the ones that internalized uh, uh you know they they're, they're never going to go in our military they're probably not going to graduate from high school they uh and they've, they've got internalized this this model of, of the sopranos they they truly believe one of the greatest achievements in life is grow up and be you know, the Sons of Anarchy, the gang lord of the end of Grand Theft Auto. Uh, the, the bad ones in our civilization are very, very bad, like nothing we've ever seen before. I mean, homicide rate exploding, mass murders in our schools, uh, mass murders on our campuses, wackos coming back to our schools and committing mass murders like Sandy Hook. And I tell people every step of the way I predicted it, I, I pray that I'm wrong, but, but what's coming next are daycare massacres and school bus massacres. So... The bad ones out there are very bad. Nobody can deny it. The bad kids out there are the worst we have ever seen uh, in human history to commit mass murders as children in their schools uh, and to grow up and give us crimes as adults we never dreamed of. But the good ones out there are very good. They fought two wars for 15 right. years with 100% wartime volunteers. You know, the last time we... Four years into this war, there was nobody left to enlist before the war got stuck with the war. Uh, and nobody is drafted in this war. For the last 10 years or more, every single person in our armed forces has raised the right hand to enlist or re-enlist in time of war. The last time we fought a war with 100% wartime volunteers was the American Revolution. We've always had like 1812, we had people enlist before the war got stuck with the war. Those were all gone in the first four years of this war. So the longer it was, we always had the draft. So, you know, when we, when we, when we look at the assassination generation, uh, the good ones are very good. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're magnificent. They're under discipline. They're under authority. They focus their, their, uh, uh, their energy in a, in a, in a socially acceptable manner. And, and when we need them, uh, uh, military and law enforcement. And the bad ones out there are very bad. The good ones are very good. Bad ones are very bad. And it depends to a large degree. On which model you've internalized, and so if if we've got a game where uh, you know we're we're the good guys, uh, it's one thing. If we're playing Grand Theft Auto Five, you know, time out. You know, that's a, that's a different factor completely. You know, are you internalizing that model of killing cops and committing criminal acts? Uh, I, I think there's all the difference in the world between uh, violent video games, and we try to make the point in the book where you. Uh, where you engage in criminal behavior or games where you are in socially structured positive action, which is in law enforcement or military. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about an, an airman that I met um, last week, the week before, and he was 18. And, um, you know, I've, I've been in the service for almost 23 years now. And, um, you know, so I've, I've got two children that are, that are older than he is, yeah. but it, it kind of dawned on me as you were talking that like his, his only view of the world that he's, he's always seen since he was able to see that there was a world outside of his own little, you know, infant brain has been, has been war and, and conflict and, you know, um, all that kind of stuff going on overseas. So, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a sobering thought. I mean, you know, the longest war in American history, no end in sight, really. Although mm. it, a better comparison is the Cold War, which lasted yeah. almost 50 years and across generations. Right. Uh, and that's that's really a, an analogy of what we got. This is a long-term war between civilizations. Uh, and uh, and like, in many ways, I think Europe is doomed. Uh, you know, if you ever want to visit Europe, do it now, because a decade or mm. two from now, it's going to be a war zone. They have a, they have a negative mm -hmm. birth rate. The, the, the Arabs have flat told them in a generation we're going to own you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, any society with negative birth rate has kind of been a slow death spiral. Uh, and then, you know, if you, if you had to have 
impoverished people to the south of you. You know, we really lucked out with Latin America. You know, mm-hmm. your basic, uh, your basic, uh, uh, you know, Mexican has got similar religious values and has got a good work ethic, and they're just good people uh, across the board. You know, it, 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 you compare that to what's lying to the south of Europe, and uh, uh, that's a very scary thing. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, unless, you know, Europe may get a El Cid, you know, they, they may get a, a Napoleon, they may get a Hitler, and, uh, they, they may just go down with a whimper, uh, mm-hmm. but it's going to be bad. Uh, and the point of all that is that this is a long war between civilizations, and uh, Islam is, is a portion of Islam, or, uh, certainly not across the board, but a sizable mm-hmm. portion of Islam, is, is challenging our civilization for for. Uh, uh, for existence, right. and this is a, this is a long, desperate war for survival, and and we need our warriors, we need our sheepdogs to carry us through these times. Disciplined individuals who uh, who will use their their authority and and their skills and their tools appropriately on the battlefield, and then bring them home, mm-hmm. and not be any more of a threat to society than than any other citizen, and hopefully. Uh, demonstrably, they've been better than the average citizen when you take that veteran and bring them home. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, one of the other things that, that we talked about in some of the other podcasts, and it's a subject that comes up a lot, is that we're in the Air Education Training Command. Yeah. And there, there's a tendency these days, especially with the, the newer generations that, come, that are coming up, that so the political correctness kind of takes a front seat sometimes, or it feels, it feels like that. Yeah. Um, and in my experience, if you just maintain basic professionalism, you know, then you don't run into, you don't run into the other issues, you know, but, but there's still a feeling among the instructors that they have to kind of walk on eggshells and they have to be a little bit afraid of the students, which I, I, th- I think is wrong. If you're just maintaining your professionalism, then you can be as bold as you want. Because you're going to be professional, it's a non-issue. But at the same time, where we talked about the the assassination generation, you know, we have to be instilling um, tougher sheepdog training on these same airmen that we have to be have a little more kids' gloves with, right? Well, I mean, to, to communicate an appropriate set of professional values. Right. You know, you got to understand that the young airmen coming in, they're they're constantly scanning their environment and saying. What kind of a person should I be? So, all right, I, I joined the Air Force. What does that mean? And then look into those instructors. They're looking at the NCOs for that model. Uh, uh, some of that political correctness, I think, you'll see go away with the current generation. I, uh, you know, I, 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 I joined the Army in 1974, mm-hmm. and we've seen the political correctness swing from the Carter administration to the Reagan administration, and then back to the. Uh, you know, the Clinton administration to the Bush administration and then back. You know, it's like this, this swing from political correctness to, to uh, you know, a, a more, a less politically correct model of, of that conservatives generally would take bring with them. I, I think you see with this current administration, some of that stuff going away. Uh, mm-hmm. Maddox, uh, you know, General Maddox as the Secretary of Defense has got enormous potential to do great good for us. And, and I'll tell you this, everybody should know this. It's something we should be aware of. But um, most people don't know how our general officers are selected. But I mean, it's just, we don't know. I didn't know until I looked it up. But mm-hmm. what, by law, they're, they're nominated by the president and approved by the Senate, just like ambassadors or federal judges. And uh, all, through, all, all gen- What's that? All, all flag officers? Or nominated by the president? Yeah. But <laughs> okay. see, through most of our history, uh, right after World War One, being a general officer was very, very political. And then around World War One, our, our, um, you know, our, our political leaders said, well, who are we to decide who should be a general or an admiral? Uh, and the services nominated them, and the president pretty much rubber stamped it. Some oversight dynamics on on numbers and. And, and then during the uh, Clinton administration, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? During the Clinton administration, uh, on the very first day in the White House, Hillary Clinton had a clash with 
what are all these people doing here? What are they, get these guys out of my house. You know, it was, it was just this incredible clash, and the Clinton administration played the game pretty hard. I was there during those years. You know, if you wanted to make general, put your politics in your pocket, put your religion in your pocket, and be pragmatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for eight years, our generals, it's not like this, this, this great pool of 06s to draw from to turn into one stars, but there they was a systematic effort. And then during the Bush administration, we're back to conservatives. We trust the military. Whatever the military recommends, uh, you know, we, we, we rubber stamp. So eight years of Clinton generals kind of nominated eight years of Bush generals. And then Obama came in and played the game harder than anybody has ever seen since the Civil War. There's a lot of write-ups on generals being fired and, and, uh, and standards. And people don't realize, uh, again, it's not – overwhelming. There's not this huge pool of liberal low sixes to draw from. But I don't think in the last hundred years we've ever seen a general so politically selected as they were during the Obama administration. And now we're back to conservatives that to fix that, to get us more in an even keel. Uh, right. it, it means you're, you're talking about the selection boards and the board managers and the uh, you know, there's there's little captains down there that are running the show, captains and majors and lieutenant colonels who are down there in the guts of the machine making the whole process work, that to a large degree, some of them need to be cycled out. I, I tell you all that because some a secretary of defense who's never been in the system doesn't really have a clue what the problem is, let alone how to fix it. But uh, General Maddox does. And uh, it's only the second time uh, since uh, World War One, World War Two, it's only the second time we've had a general officer as Secretary of Defense, and it, and it's a good thing. So a lot of that, I, I just submit to you, sit back and watch. Uh, there has been political correctness. Uh, it, it is true. There has been pressure from the highest level to to toe the line on on kind of uh, liberal military values, and, and I think you'll see some of that move away, uh, and it's kind of the normal cycle over time. Uh, but it's it's taken a lot of time moving in one direction. Now there may be some movement in the other direction. Does that all make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I wish I, I wish there was some way that you can make military service uh, um, mandatory for service in Washington. That would, um, yeah, because not 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 because it's necessarily going to give yeah. favorable treatment to the military, but military service just gives you a different perspective on life yeah. than somebody who's just a, just an attorney. You know, or or just a businessman. I don't want to say just a businessman, you know, because they they fight their own battles. But yeah, it's it's a unique breed of folks, and I wish we had more. You know, I, I think you'll see a time. You know, I remember when Elvis Presley was the biggest star in America, and he was drafted, and he served right. two years and went back out, and it was all a very good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I think you may see that return. The problem is that in the current military. Two years is not enough time to really make anybody useful. You know, for, for you know, my field of knowledge and infantrymen, once you got two years under your belt, you're just barely able to make a major contribution to your squad on the battlefield. Uh, so two-year draftees were of limited value. But during World War II, the Canadians, uh, volunteers were sent overseas draftees were used internally. Now, they did not make anybody go to war. They, they made people be parts of the military. They had the draft. But they mm-hmm. did not make them go to war unless they volunteered. And I could see us with the, the threat that lies in front of us. You know, it, it takes two years to make a good infantryman, calling in artillery, calling in uh, uh, airstrikes, uh, being able to uh, set uh, a Claymore mine, and think of all the host of, of skills that are needed. But I can train you a great big border. I can train you a great border patrol agent in uh, in three months. I can make you a, a hell of a cop in in three or four months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think what you might see with the crazy times coming down the road is you might see a national service in which everybody won't be in the service. They'll they'll do their time either they volunteer and they go overseas, or mm-hmm. they don't and there'll be uh, internal security, very much like the Israeli model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you might see the national service. You know, one of the problems is so many of them are overweight. Uh, we've had mm-hmm. secretaries yeah. of defense say obesity is, is a national defense challenge. 
Yep. But if we got them all in for two years, you know, we could we could put them on a healthy lifestyle, and we could we could get their weight under control, and we could make a difference. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, you may see a movement in that direction, but it will be yes. slightly different. Just understand that, you know, millions of two-year draftees are of limited value to us on the current battlefield. But mm-hmm. if we use some internally, you did national service. You worked in the local hospital. You worked, uh, you know, at the Vista or the Peace Corps. There are a lot of ways we could do national service. And you might see a lot of people just echoing what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And it's within the realm of possibility in our lifetimes we, we, we may see that. Yeah, but I've been, I've been wanting that for years. Even like the National Park Service, and there's, there's so many things that need to be done. Exactly. Border yeah. Patrol. Yeah, Border Patrol. That's a huge one. Yeah. Um, well, because so we're at like right about 40 minutes right now. Yeah. And um, so I'm wondering, for, I'm probably about time to wrap it up, but I'm wondering... So you said that your son is a, he's a master sergeant and um, is he combat controller? Yep. Wow, that's intense. I've known a few master sergeant combat controllers over the years and just fantastic people. Just uh, a lot of respect for them. I worked, so right now I work in civil engineering, but when I was an airman, I was a helicopter crew chief on the 53s and spent a lot of time. That was during the Bosnian conflict. So I was down in, um, we spent a lot of time down in Briz- Brindisi, Italy. And, um, you know, running, running those sorties down there and worked with a lot of the special forces folks. Um, yeah, I got, that was, that was when I got all my really great war stories from my, my, my first enlistment, you know, but, um, one thing I do want to ask you though, is, so I know you've had a lot of experience with airmen, with your son and just people, you know, just touring around the country. Um, and, and I've got every week, I've got a new group of of brand new airmen coming in, you know, they're all bright eyed and bushy tailed and ready to go and eager to learn and become better airmen. Um, regarding the sheepdog mentality though, it, what would like, if you could, if you could be a ventriloquist for a minute and just use my words, like what kind of message would you want me to get to the new airmen that are coming in? Well, you know, I, I, I had the honor to go over to England a little while back and they had the, um, uh, the maintainers there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I had a um, a chief master sergeant tell me, he said, you know, this new generation coming in are magnificent. They uh, they, they they really want to learn, and they got the capacity mm-hmm. to learn maintenance skills, and they will teach each other, and they'll pull out their cell phone and they'll 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 pull up a, a you know a, <laughs> a, a walkthrough of what needs to be done, and they will show it to others. Yeah. We 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 tend to talk about. The problems with each generation, but this coming generation is a great deal to give. Mm. And uh, and I, I think if we if we tell them just uh, you know have faith in our nation, have faith in our way of life, mm. understand that there's a reason why we do the things we do. That the, the haircuts, the uniforms, those are the safeguards. Mm. Uh, we've we've taken you to the range. We've given you hours and hours of. Uh, of rifle marksmanship is the baseline skill. We expect you to be able to use that skill in the years to come. Um, but we don't do that without the safeguard of discipline. And the message I always try to put to everybody is believe in who you are, believe in what you do. Uh, primarily what I teach is resilience. Yeah, I call it the bulletproof mind. And the first step in resiliency is motivation. To know that your sacrifice is for a noble and worthy purpose. Mm-hmm. It, it, look at the news daily. Look at, uh, you know, the... Uh, just yesterday, we had the bombing of the, 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 the Christian churches in Egypt. Uh, you know, 40 people dead, hundreds wounded. Um, well, we'll look around the planet and understand how much the world needs that you have to give. Uh, uh, understand how violent the world is and how very much your nation needs what you have to give. Mm-hmm. Uh, the step one in motivation, is, is step one in resiliency, is to know that the world needs what you have to give. The world is a desperate, violent place. Scary things are happening every day. And every bad thing that happens in that world should renew your faith that the world needs what you have to give. Mm. I tell people, you know, you've been like Batman. The average citizen on Gotham City watched the news, crime, death, violence. What do they do? Hunger down, hide, lock the door. Batman hears about crime and violence. What does he do? He trains his tail off. Mm-hmm. And then he goes out and uses his skills to hunt the Batman. Hmm. Uh, the, the sheep are always trying to pull you down. You know, why do you have those haircuts? Why do you wear those uniforms? Why do you march together? Why do you do this stuff? You know, 
it, it, it's because it's essentially who we are. The, the sheep are trying to pull you down, uh, mm. but you got to believe in who you are. you got to believe in what you do. Mm. Uh, everything we do is for a good purpose, and our nation very desperately needs you. And every bad thing that happened that the world should renew your faith, that the world needs what you have to give. And I mean, Coming into the armed forces is a sacrifice. And your sacrifice is for a noble and worthy purpose. Right. Well, that was awesome. That was perfect. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you for your time. And um, I think that a lot of people are going to really appreciate this. Um, like I said before, I, w I will also put in... Um, links because I, I just post this stuff on youtube because it's free for now um i'll put in links to to your website and to some of the books that you have available yeah um and lo lots of other your resources and uh so yeah keep getting the keep getting the word out and i also want to just um personal thank you for the work that you've done and the, um the way that you've committed your life to to spreading this word and keeping us safe and um to the military and civilians and everybody and just a heartfelt thank you for everything that you do. And, and to you, my brother. Thanks for what thank you, you do. We have an incredibly uh, amazing group of Americans after 15 years of war. Mm -hmm. Our armed forces has never seen anything like this. Uh, when that generation who's never known anything but war uh, is in the senior leadership positions, mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty amazing. And so yeah. believe in who you are and, uh, and all of that right back at you. God bless and stay safe. Thank you. You too, sir. It's a common idea that society can be broken down into sheep, wolves, and sheepdogs. It's a generalization, but a good model. Folks in the military, law enforcement, and emergency services are the sheepdogs. Folks who only want to hurt and maim are the wolves. Here's part of an essay about sheepdogs. The sheep generally do not like the sheepdog. He looks a lot like the wolf. He has fangs and the capacity for violence. The difference, though, is that the sheepdog must not, cannot, and will not ever harm the sheep. Any sheepdog who intentionally harms the lowliest little lamb will be punished and removed. The world cannot work any other way, at least not in a representative democracy or a republic such as ours. Still, the sheepdog disturbs the sheep. He is a constant reminder that there are wolves in the land. They would prefer that he didn't tell them where to go, or give them traffic tickets, or stand at the ready in our airports in camouflage fatigues holding an M16. The sheep would much rather have the sheepdog cash in his fangs, spray paint himself white, and go bah, until the wolf shows up. Then the entire flock tries to hide behind the one lonely sheepdog. And that's all I have to say. Keep flying, keep fighting, and keep winning.